All right, post-flood period, termination of the post-flood, of the worldwide flood, leads to some important evidence that seems the only evidence that ex is explained best by the worldwide flood. And that period afterwards, what would have happened and what did happen. Let's take a look at this. BibleStudyManuals.net, K41.htm. We left off at the termination <coughs> of the deluge proper, occupying a period of a little more than a year, measured between the times of Noah and his family entered and left the ark, and it did not by any means mark the termination of the abnormal Hydraulic, hydraulic, hydrologic, and geomorphic phenomena. <coughs> Almost unimaginably profound changes had taken place in the entire domain of the terrestrial energetics. The precipitation of the antediluvian canopy instituted a new hydrologic cycle, as well as a new cycle of seasons. A larger proportion of the Earth's surface was now taken up in ocean basins and water surface areas. The pre-Diluvian topography was completely changed, with great mountain chains and deep basins now replacing the formal gentle and more nearly uniform topography. Removal of the protective canopy, the ice canopy above, which rained everything down, gave us the worldwide flood, around the Earth permitted development of extreme latitudinal variations of temperature, with resulting great air movements in established climatic, zone, climatic zones. Removal of the canopy also permitted the Earth's atmosphere to be penetrated by much larger amounts of radiation of various types, and perhaps also by interplanetary gas or dust. Isostatic adjustments of the rocks and water and other materials near the Earth's surface were profoundly distributed, disturbed and altered. And it is obvious that these and other geophysical changes associated with the flood could not have been completely accomplished and stabilized for centuries. So he says, with the conclusion of the flood epoch, God promised that no more such earth-shaking aqueous cataclysms, no more floods, would ever be visited on the earth worldwide as long as it remained. And the Lord smelled the smoothing aroma of Noah's sacrifice and the Lord said to himself, I will never again curse the ground on account of man, for the intent of man's heart is evil from his youth, and I will never again destroy every living thing as I have done. While the earth remains, seed time and harvest, and cold and heat, and summer and winter, and day and night shall not cease. So that's the new plan. In general, uniform processes of nature would henceforth prevail. That's what we see today. Thus, the geological dogma of uniformity can, with certain limitations, be applied to the study of this period. However, it's transitional. However, even here, the principle must be sufficiently elastic to accommodate numerous minor disturbances recorded in Scripture and perhaps implied in ancient mythologies, as, well, as probably as many others of which the only records are those in the geologic deposits themselves. It is likely that a large proportion, even of present geological work, is accomplished during brief, intense periods of Earth activity in floods, earthquakes, volcanic eruptions, and similar events. We have volumes of books on this, local disturbances, cataclysmic ones for the area, putting my jacket on here, and uh, we say, wow, well, what would happen if it was worldwide? We just project it up to that point and say, well, the plausibility of a worldwide flood seems to explain a lot of things that the geological strata of uniformitarianists and evolutionists seem to be puzzled with. So we have the rapid worldwide dispersion of man <coughs> and animals <coughs> and plants, and that was possible after the flood. <coughs> if the flood was geographically universal, that all the air breathers of the animal kingdom, which were not in the ark, perished. And present-day animal distribution must be explained on the basis of migrations 
from the mountains of Ararat. Three major views attempt to explain the present worldwide distribution of animals. There are three mainly generally accepted views. First, advocates of the local flood claim that most of the animals, probably created by, by God or however they want to term it, in the ecological niches, niches where they are now found. <coughs> We have the advocates of a universal flood who believe that these animals must have reached their present locations by ways of migration during the centuries that followed the flood. Another possible variation of this theory is that after a universal flood, the animals were recreated in their present ecological niches. However, this expedient would eliminate the need of an ark to preserve the animals through the flood and, of course, is not suggested in the biblical account. And thirdly, we have the evolutionary school of modern science, which explains such distribution on the basis of gradual processes of migration over millions and millions of years, together with the evolution of totally new kinds of animals in geographically isolated areas. It is necessary to show only that a general migration of animals from the Near East since the flood is reasonable and possible. Now we have... Looking at around the world, we have the uniqueness of Australian marsupials does not contradict a worldwide animal migration from the ark. Critics maintain that since marsupials are only found in Australia, that a worldwide animal migration from the ark in Mesopotamia is refuted. Let me lower myself down here. I'm not above this subject. On the assumption that the animals of the present world trace their ancestry back to those within the ark, how can we explain the fact that those mar these marsupials and monotremes are found nowhere in the world except in Australia and that the placentals never succeeded in reaching that subcontinent? Question. Since fossil marsupials have been found in Europe as well as in Australia, and the Western Hemisphere, it seems evident that they have migrated rather widely in the past. Fossil record. The Old Testament informs us that Palestine was infested with lions for centuries. Not there now. And it came about at the beginning of their living there that they did not fear the Lord. Therefore, the Lord sent lions among them, which killed some of them. That's in Second Kings 17.25. But where is the fossil evidence for their having been in Palestine? Well, it is a well-known fact that animals leave fossil remains only under rare and special conditions. Therefore, the lack of fossil evidence for marsupials in southern Asia cannot be used as proof that they have never been in that region of the world. Remember, more likely, the worldwide flood, not millions of years of, of whatever conditions created the fossil records, the, the worldwide flood created the fossil record, and there was no more worldwide flood. An even more familiar example is that the American bison or buffalo. Buffalo carcasses strewn all over, over the plains and uncounted millions two generations ago have left hardly a, a present trace. The flesh was devoured by wolves or vultures within hours or days after death, and even the skeletons have now largely disappeared, the bones dissolving and crumbling into dust under the attack of the weather. So, by Dunbar, no one can prove that kangaroos and the other Australian marsupials were confined to Australia before the flood, <clears throat> since no fossil kangaroos have been found in Australia earlier than the so-called Pleistocene era. No one can prove that any of them are antediluvian either. The journeys from the mountains of Ararat, where the mammals disembarked from the ark, to their present habitats <clears throat> were made in an intermittent fashion, each generation sending representatives a little farther from the original home. The presence of tapers today only in South America and the Malayan islands, to opposite sides of the earth, is indic indicative of the fact that animals migrated in more than one direction. Creationists hold that there is no reason for believing that this distribution of animals was accomplished by any other processes than those employed in distribution today. Increase in number of individuals of any kind causes a necessity for spreading outward toward the horizon in search of food and homes. 
their arrival in new areas may be a result of deliberate individual endeavor, or it may be that they arrive as the wave-tossed survivors of some coastal accident. Rapid animal dispersion in recent history supports worldwide animal migration from the Arctic. There is some evidence available to show that animals could have reached their present habitats with astonishing speed, <clears throat> crossing vast amounts, vast continents, and even wide stretches of open sea on their way. In the year 1883, the island of Krakatoa in the Sunda Strait between Java and Sumatra was almost destroyed by a volcanic explosion that shook the entire part of the world. That entire part. For 25 years, practically nothing lived in the remnant of that volcanic island. But then the colonists began to arrive. A few mammals in 1908, a number of birds, lizards, snakes, various mollusks, insects, and earthworms. 90% of Krakatoa's new inhabitants, Dutch scientists found, were forms that could have arrived by air. Professor Moody, University of Vermont, tells how large animals may have been able to cross oceans on natural rafts, or uh, you call them floating islands. In terms of flood, large masses of earth and then and twining vegetation, including trees, may be torn loose from the banks of rivers and swept out to sea. Sometimes such masses are encountered floating in the ocean, out of sight of land, still lush and green, with palms 20 to 30 feet tall. It is entirely probable that land animals may be transported long distances in this manner. Mayer records that many tropical ocean currents have a speed of at least two knots. This would amount to 50 miles a day, 1,000 miles in three weeks. Professor Schull makes the interesting observation that the fauna of Madagascar is most similar not to that of its continental neighbor Africa, but that to of Asia, Asia. the gap being bridged over by the, the Seychelles Islands, whose animals are similar to those of Madagascar. But when we look at the map of the Indian Ocean, our astonishment increases. For Seychelles Islands are 700 miles north of Madagascar, and the Asiatic mainland is nearly 1,500 miles beyond that. The monkey-like lemur is practically the only mammal found in Madagascar, so it would seem that lemurs found their way across 2,200 miles of the Indian Ocean in order to reach the island, which is now their home. <clears throat> Paul Al Almasi while it is true that even the open sea has proven to be no barrier, no final barrier to the onrushing migrations of animals, we must look at the land, to the land bridges and the principal means of animal distribution around the world. One glance at a world map will show that, with the exception of the narrow break at the Bering Strait, a dry path, dry land path, leads from Armenia, Armenia to all lands of the globe except Australia. In the case of the latter, the East, Indians, even to the East Indies, even today, form a fairly continuous bridge of stepping stones to that southern continent. As regards the Bering Strait, there is no doubt that a land connection once existed between Asia and North America. Evidence of Ice Age points to a recent cat catastrophic worldwide flood. Onset of the Ice Age. Goes on. Similar topic here. The lowering of the temperature of the polar latitudes of the vapor canopy precipitated would have had immediate and important climatologic changes. However, the initially warm temperatures of the water in the polar seas, together with its continuing turbulent state, suffice to present its freezing for a period of unknown but substantial duration. I make one little exception here. Vapor canopy. Uh, I may make more of a case, it seems to be made, of a, a frozen water canopy further on up about nine miles in the stratosphere would create a frozen canopy over the earth, filtering the sunlight and providing the water for the worldwide flood when time came. Undoubtedly, I say the first water actually to freeze would have been that mixed with the sediments being deposited in these regions cut off, as it were, from the water, warmer temperatures and the turbulent agitation of the free water in the open seas, thus must have been formed at some intermediate or late stage of the deluge period. These vast stretches of permanently frozen soils in the Arctic 
and some Arctic, subarctic, known as permafrost.